you know, it was amazing on Monday to watch what uh, happens when the Lord gets busy with the atmosphere, isn't it? When you take a look at the sun being blocked out by the moon and everything has to be just exactly as it should be. You know, they were so amazed that the, the sun is 400 times further away from the earth than the, the moon is. However, the moon is 400 times closer and its size is just exactly the right size in order to make it block out on the, on the earth for just a short period of time. And I'm going, no, that doesn't surprise me. He says, why? God does all things well. And he does it exactly as he should do it. And everything is exactly as it should be. It also was amazing to me to take a look at uh, a satellite that was orbiting the earth that they had looked down on Texas and, and Missouri and Arkansas and all the states. And you could actually see the black dot on the earth from the sun and moon and just going, yep, the Lord knows what he's doing and everything else that's involved that's in there, you know, temperature drops five degrees, everything is just as it should be. And it happens right according to the schedule that has been ordained. It does not change. God is the master of it. It happens just as he has determined at those times. So uh, it was amazing. It also was amazing that that's the first time in a long time I've seen people in harmony. They weren't fighting with one another. They weren't yelling at one another. They were all going, ooh, and seeing the, the marvel that was there. Not when gatherings and not one shooting. Yeah, huge gatherings. And what you can say at the same time is, uh, you know, uh, what is, what, when you consider the stars and the sun and the moon and all the things that are in creation, what is man that you are mindful of him, Lord? We seem to recognize that we're really small in comparison with this big, big old universe, but yet God is mindful of us. And that is just an amazing thing. So uh, Monday was kind of an interesting day. Yeah, Mary Jean and I did go out on our backyard and took our glasses that we had bought specially for it and looked up at the sun and saw it block out in its own way. And then you watched to about four hours later and it was abs absolutely gone and everything was changed. It was just exactly as it should be. So uh, the eclipse was an interesting phenomenon that is actually set by God and is determined by God and will happen until he comes. And then there'll be no more sun and moon because there'll be a new heaven and a new earth at that time. And you won't have the need for an eclipse or anything along those lines. Plus, the Lord himself is going to be the luminescence for the earth at that time. So we've got uh, some tremendous things that are involved there. So uh, I don't know if you took the time to go outside and take a look at it, or if you did like my son-in-law did and uh, my daughter did, they actually went to a place where they could see it in totality. And that's just a very, very special occasion um, at that time. Anybody actually go outside to look at it? I went out with school kids. Did you? Yes. I was invited to do that. That's special. It really is. Uh, last time it happened, we went uh, over, over to Oswego in, uh, on the 70 freeway, uh, about oh, an hour away from our house because that allowed us to get into the totality area. And we were surprised that we found a park and there was a whole bunch of people there and a whole bunch of school kids. And we just had a good time together watching this thing happen at that time. This one was more intense because the sun was more active. You could actually see that little flip down at the bottom and at the top, which indicates that there was a, a storm on the, on the sun. And the interesting thing is that that little blip that's off of the bottom and the little blip that's at the top is as big as the earth is. So if you take that little blip, that's the size of the earth. Uh, that, that's kind of phenomenal to think about, isn't it? In its own regards. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. We started this last week. We're going to continue it again this week, and we're going to begin, I think, uh, go back to verses 7 and 8 here. Uh, actually, let's start with verse 5, and we'll go on from there. He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. 
And he said, write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water to the one who thirsts, and from the spring of the water of life without cost. The one who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, sexual immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those verses there are really kind of an indication of what God's going to do. He says he's making all things brand new again. And basically what it means is that the earth, which is under a curse at this point, is going to be made brand new. He says also something about himself, right? For these words are faithful and true. How many of you have uh, made a contract with somebody and it hasn't been fulfilled? Any of you? I've had contracts that I make with people and they come pretty close to being fulfilled, but usually there's some alterations in them at the last moment. Build a house quite a while ago and as I made the contract with people, there was set costs that they had and then when the actual building took place, they said, well, here were the additional things that we had to do to cause that, so here's the additional costs. Now, that's to be expected because they can't calculate everything that has to be done. But when God makes his decrees, they are always faithful, they are always true, and they are always very accurate. Uh, yesterday, we had one of those occasions that you don't like to hear about. We had a furnace go out at the beginning of the year. Yesterday, all of a sudden, the stove wouldn't light. Now, I had changed igniters before, so I knew that the igniters were fairly new. Uh, this time, neither the broiler nor the uh, oven would light. And it just flashed on for just a short period of time and then went off. Called a repairman this morning because that sounded to me to be like a, a control board. More than anything else, he said, yeah, that's what it sounds like to me too. He says, what's the serial number on your, on your stove? And then he goes, well, they don't make those parts anymore. So, you know, it's too... Too old in its own regards, he said. Uh, as soon as I gave him the number, he said, it's dead. He goes, go get a new one. And I said, oh, okay. What You're the repairman. What really works? He says, they're all just about the same. Go ahead and get one. No, that, that's real good instruction, isn't it? But God says he is alpha and omega, faithful and true. He also says that it is done. When he says it's done, it means the plan has been made. At this point in creation, everything has come to the point where it is supposed to be. He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is always in the eternal present through all of those sessions. There is never a time when he is behind. He is the beginning and the end. Now, the interesting thing is that when he was talking to the woman at the well, he told her that he would give her water and she would never have to come and get that again, remember? Uh, give me to drink. And she said, why do you ask to give me a drink? He said, well, if you had known who asked you that, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water, which would flow out abundantly for you. And she said, give me that water. Notice what is going to happen in heaven here. It says... <laughs> I will give water to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life. God is going to have a spring in heaven and it is going to be the water of life and it is going to be ours and it is without what? Cost. There is no cost for it because the cost has already been paid. The cost was the blood of Jesus Christ that provides for salvation for us. And because he is supplying that water for us, we never have to do the things that um, will allow us to, to grab that. Uh, it can't be, we cannot earn it, we cannot buy it, we cannot do anything with it because God's given it to us freely and he's given us to us through Jesus Christ. However, you'll notice something else. It says after that, oh, the one who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. 
God says to the people who are overcomers, the ones who believe in Christ, that he will allow them to consider him their God. I will be their God. And it also says at the same time, they will be my son. A son relationship is very special. I watched some people who were not able to have children naturally, who adopted some children and went through all the processes that were necessary in order to do a full adoption. And when they were up in Kansas City at where the uh, old life tower was, the life tower was, they would ring the bell indicating that they had now had a new family member. And what they were saying is that that is your son, that is your daughter, and you have them for the rest of your life. We have the adoption of sons, and we are his forevermore, and we will never be outside of that. And that is just a joyous event. There is a special bonding relationship. I can see other kids, but I have a special relationship with Aaron. I have a special relationship with Wendy. They are my children. They are those who are part of me. And we will have that type of relationship with God, a very, very special relationship. You know, as I talk to family members during times of, uh, of grief, it's always interesting that the one thing that they always center on is the family moments that they had together when they did some special things, the fun things that they did and the outlandish things that they did to one another. And it is the joyous moments that they have. You know, we always take a look at those moments that's as the most special ones. I've never seen anybody, boy, I just really wish I had two more days at work. We don't want that. I wish I had a, another time of doing my income taxes. I never heard anybody say that. And if they did, I thought they'd have a fever. Uh, but the simple fact is that we don't really consider those things as special. It's relationships that we consider special. And God has told us we'll be his children, we will be his God, and we will be specially related to him. Notice it also says in verse 8, but for the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, those who are doing wrong things, and murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior, those who are in the midst of their sin still, they are going to spend their eternity in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Dr. James Kennedy talked to a man one time that... Uh, he didn't know whether the guy had ever become a believer or not. And he said, uh, you died, didn't you? He says, yeah, I died. And I came back. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, uh, how, what, what did you experience? Do you remember anything about it? And the guy said, uh, yeah, I remember something about it. He says, I saw a lake that was coming around and there was flames all around it. And those flames were engulfing me. And the pain was more than I had ever experienced in my life. He says, have you ever experienced real pain? And the guy reached down and tapped on his wooden leg. And Kennedy said, what happened there? He says, well, when I was young, I was playing on some railroad cars. And I fell off of the railroad cars and my leg went underneath the wheel of the railroad and it cut my leg off. And he said, the pain that you experienced in that lake after you died was worse than that. He says, oh, far worse than that. I've never experienced anything like that. To Kennedy's knowledge, at that point, this man had still not become a believer. But he had experienced evidently what it is going to be like to be engulfed eventually by the lake of fire. And he said the pain was just tremendous and horrendous. At the same time, we have to say something else. Scripture tells us that all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And it has told us that all of us 
have been in some standpoints much like what we just described there. Take your Bibles and turn back to 1 Corinthians, and I believe it's chapter 6. Well, it would help if I got to 1 Corinthians instead of 2 1 Corinthians 6, look at verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolater, nor the adulterer, nor the homosexual, nor thieves, nor greedy persons, or those habitually drunk, or verbally abusive, or swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice the very next sentence. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. The first description is the description of everybody. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all worthy of eternal separation from God. But because of what Jesus Christ did for us, we have been justified, we have been sanctified, we have been set apart by God so that we might be a part of heaven. We are given heaven, not because we earned it, but because he saved us, period. And you can make that an exclamation point. We are saved by the blood of the lamb, not by what we do. But if you don't receive what his gift is, then you have to have the judgment, and the judgment is that you will be separated from God for all eternity. And I can imagine that every time the gospel was ever shared with a person during their lifetime, every time they had an opportunity to turn to God will run through their mind throughout all eternity in that they could have accepted that, could have turned to it, but they chose not to do it. They will have already admitted because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is God to the glory of the Father, that he is God, but that they never received what his gift was. And the time of their receipt, the time that they could receive it is now gone. It is just that way. Uh, you know, we have a whole lot of people that said, well, we, we, we ought to be given a second chance. A uh, second chance in this particular case is not what scripture talks about, does it? Doesn't say you get a second chance, doesn't say you get a third chance, doesn't say go to purgatory for a hundred billion trillion years and then come out. You are going to be judged immediately and that judgment is going to be for eternity and there will be no change in that judgment because you have failed the Lord. Notice then what it says about what's going to take place. Begin with verse 9. In verses 9 through 11, we have the new Jerusalem as the bride. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very valuable stone, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and the gates, 12 angels, and the names were written on the gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. A lot there to unpack in there. Quite a bit. John is taken by one of the angels that poured out the bowls. So we know it's after the tribulation period. It's after the millennial kingdom. One of those 12 angels comes and says, 
come here and I'm going to show you what's going to take place here. He's given a special vision concerning what's going to take place. He carries John in the spirit to a great and high mountain. Now, we don't know which mountain that is talking about. That's not the important thing. It's just that John is taken up and shown what is going to happen. And he shows him the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And that new Jerusalem is coming down out of the heavens uh, from God. The indication seems to be, according to Ari Tori and others, that during the millennial kingdom, the new Jerusalem orbits the earth or rests upon one section of it, you know, turns at the same pace as it. But that at the millennial, uh, at the eternal state, it comes down and actually rests upon the earth. And the scripture says that it will have the glory of God. It is obvious that by looking at the city, it is not just a city that is amazing. It is a city that has the Shekinah glory of God upon it. Her brilliance was like a very valuable stone, a stone like crystal clear jasper. Now, crystal clear jasper is not the normal color of a jasper. Jasper is usually a reddish type stone in its regards, but this one's crystal clear. And its brilliance is kind of what you would consider a diamond to be with all of its facets. So it's clear and reflects light tremendously and brilliantly. So the city itself appears like a brilliant stone, like a, a diamond ring, if you want to call it that. And of course, it's a diamond ring unlike any others. You know, the diamond ring that was seen on the eclipse where it shows at the very beginning, at the very end, it's amazing in its own regard. You go, wow, look at that. The new Jerusalem appears like a diamond. It has glory to it. It will be something that you go, ooh. You know, the Taj Mahal is supposed to be a, a very majestic wonder of the world. And people who see it really remark at how special it is. You go to Washington, D.C., and you see some of the monuments that are there. And those are very special. You see places like Niagara Falls and you go, wow, what the wonder is. The diamond ring of God's creation at this point is going to be the new Jerusalem, heaven here on earth. That is going to be what it is. And you'll notice it says it had great and high walls with 12 gates. We're going to talk about those high walls in just a little bit. But the walls that go around the city, they're on the north, the south, the east, and the west. It means that the city on its base is at least a square. At the same time, it's going to tell you later on that it's the same height. 1,500 furlongs one way, 1,500 furlongs straight up and down. Now, that means that it could be in two different shapes. It can either be a cube or it can be a pyramid because a pyramid will have the same base and it all comes up to one spot. I rather think it's going to be a cube. And you say, why? Glad you asked. Here it is. What was the shape of the Holy of Holies? You had a rectangle, but the Holy of Holies itself was a cube, the same height and width. So God's going to make the new Jerusalem, I think, probably the same way. It will be a cube. If I'm wrong, okay, that doesn't bother me. But at the same time, the pyramids of Egypt are nothing, bud, nothing at all compared to what God is going to build and what God is going to have. You'll notice that it says here that there are 12 gates, three on each side. There is an angel at each of the gates. We're not sure what the names of those angels are, but there are 12 of them. And those 12 angels are there for protection and to guard the gates and to make sure that it is 
uh, only the correct people who enter into those gates. On the gate is, each of the gates is written one of the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So the 12 tribes of Israel, each will have a gate all the way around. Now we're not told in which order those will be. It could be in the same order that you find in the tabernacle, but it doesn't have to be because scripture isn't specific here as to what it is going to be. But the tribes of Israel will be named on those gates. And you'll notice at the same time, it says that there will be 12 foundation stones given on this foundation. What's a foundation stone for? What? It's for support. It's to make everything square. It's to make it correct. It's to make it to, to where you have what you need for the building to stand up. And the 12 uh, stones of, of the, the walls themselves are going to be the 12 apostles. Those are the stones that they are. Again, we're not told which apostles go where. Which ones are north, which ones are east, which ones are south, which ones are, are, are north. You don't know that. It doesn't make any difference to us which ones there are. God is going to determine that, and it will be that way for all eternity at the same time. And they are the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Judas isn't going to be one of those. It's very possible that Paul will be listed in the 12, or whether Matthias is, I'm not sure, but we will have 12 that are given to us. We're not given them specifically here at this particular point. Isn't it interesting that the 12 tribes of Israel mark his chosen people? It's interesting at the same time that the 12 apostles who taught the word of God throughout the entire world at that time, they were the ones who shared the gospel, which brought all of us into the fold as well. So you have a connection that way and that the angels themselves are overseeing it all, even though they cannot experience the grace of God like we do. So there is a tremendous difference there. Now, notice what it says in verse 15. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod, 12,000 stadia, its length, its width, and its height are equal. And he measured the walls, 144 cubits by human measurement, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, the city, was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation stone of the city's walls were decorated in every kind of precious stone. The first stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedon, the fourth emerald, the fifth sarxedon, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth creophase, the eleventh jasper, and the 12 amethyst and the 12 gates were 12 pearls each one of the gates was a single pearl and the streets of the city was pure gold like transparent glass i want to tell you if you ever wanted to see something that is in a magnificent city that's it because when you describe that that's almost unfathomable that you can have it it's uh interesting to here are some of the connections of it. Now, I'm turning to a MacArthur study Bible at the particular moment because he's got all of those stones mentioned, and I haven't really memorized them as to what their colors are, and I think that they give us a, a real indication. The reed that is talked about, the gold reed, is also seen in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 3, and the reed was about 10 feet long, which is and was a standard of measuring. And he was to measure the city, which is an indication of the capital of heaven belonging to God. And he is uh, measuring it with him. It is 12,000 furlongs. 
that would be nearly 1,400 miles cubed. To give you an idea of how far that is, if you take where we're at and go to Los Angeles, that's about that many miles. Or you can go from here to New York, and that's about how many miles it is. So one of the two directions, that's the distance, and you have to cube that. So you have really, what, 144,000 cubic miles uh, in that 144,000 cubic miles inside just the base of the city, let alone the height. You can figure out the cube if you want to, Wayne. I'll let you do that. He used to be the mathematician, so I'll let him take that one on. And it says that the wall is 144 cubits tall. A cubit is the distance from here to the tip of your finger. It's about 18 inches on the typical man. And that 18 inches represents what the cubit is. So it's 216 feet tall. That's the wall. Now, I didn't ever think of it this way, but the scripture seems to indicate at the same time that this wall that's 216 feet tall is also 216 feet wide. Remember in those days when you had a wall around a city, you oftentimes set it up to where chariots could run on it. So this may be 216 feet wide as at the at the part of it too. It has a lot of stones in the wall. Um, any of you have a wall around your house? Okay. Now I noticed that there's a wall just past uh, the the high school. It's got a whole bunch of rock around it. Yeah, yeah. you know. That would have cost a lot of money to do, but it really isn't very pretty, is it? I want you to take a look at what's in this wall. It says that it has jasper, kind of diamond-like material, pure gold, clear like glass. Unlike the gold that is on the earth, this will be transparent and so overpowering of the radiance of God's glory that it will reflect and glisten in the light of the city. It says that uh, at the same time, there are some of the names of gems that have changed through the centuries and it's difficult to know each one per stone. Eight of the 12 stones found here are in the breastplate of the high priest and the other four are also related to the breastplate. The gems pictured are brilliant, indescribable, they're beautiful colors. They show the light of God's glory. It is almost kind of like a rainbow in color. You have sarxodon, which is a variety of chalcedon in a parallel of red and white. Sardis is a common stone of the quartz family and ranges in color from orange red to brownish red or blood red. Chrysolite is a gem which is transparent gold or yellowish in tone. Burl is a mineral which serves in a variety of gems ranging from emerald green to golden yellow burl and to light blue aquamarine. Topaz is an ancient stone which is yellow or yellowish green. Um, chrysoprase is a modern form of a jewel is an, an apple green variety of quartz. And jasmine is a, a reddish brown redstone at this point. And amethyst, of course, is a purple tint to it as it goes about. Uh, get the idea that this wall isn't gonna be dull. I mean, it's going to be really something to take a look at. Mary Jean's not on the, on the, the TV tonight. But what she told me at one point was that we would go to Washington, D.C. And as we were going in, that it had rained that night. And as we were going into town, I was uh, trying to pay attention to where I was going because I'd never driven in Washington, D.C. before. And all of a sudden, the danger alarm went off in the car. By that, I mean my wife went, oh, every time we are about to hit something or we're going to have to avoid something, she goes, oh. And this time she went, 
And I'm looking around going, where, 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 where? I don't see a thing. And all of a sudden I look to my left and there's the Capitol building of the United States. And it was gleaming in the reflected light of the rainstorm. And it was just gorgeous to take a peek at. Can you imagine a city with a wall 214 feet high, 216 feet high, that is just absolutely brilliant in color and it's thick and everything is just mixed together perfectly in a way that only God could do. And you can take a look at that and you can say that's God's city. That's the abode of the saints. That is the dwelling place that he has for us, that he has made. How many cubic feet is it? Now, what was the the dimensions there? Were those feet that you gave me fourteen hundred? That was miles. Miles. Okay, we're talking about two billion seven hundred forty-four million cubic miles. Two about two million square miles at the base. That is, you know, just astronomical, isn't it? Just astronomical to think of. And that's what God is going to have us dwell in. And I, I want you Question to look at I have about the wall. Okay. Now, we talked about it being cubic. Now, where's the wall? Is it outside of that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's two other things about it. What's the biggest pearl you've ever seen? What about, about, about a, a ping pong ball size? Is that what you're saying? You ain't seen nothing yet. Because in heaven, those 12 gates that are around it, that are allowing entry, each one has a gate of a single pearl. It is going to be amazing in its own regards that they can be that large and be that operational that God is going to supply them. That's one pearl, those 12 pearls around the city. And each one... Well, Gates, each one has a giant pearl. Um, how many of you have an asphalt driveway? I do. Or how many of you have concrete driveway? I've got that. That's not what you're going to have in heaven. Uh, streets won't be ugly asphalt like that out there. They're going to be gold, pure gold. The gold is so pure that it is clear and that you can see through it. Now, we don't know. It doesn't ever tell us what the dwelling places in heaven look like at this point, right? What's the best part of your house? The wall and the driveway or the house? I hope it's the house, right? Imagine if God took that care to do a wall and that care to do the streets, what do the dwelling places look like? How special will they be? How marvelous has God done in his creation of them for us for all eternity? And that's what heaven is like. I had a lady by the name of uh, Julia Birkin. Julia was a, an interesting woman. When I got to Trinity Bible Church of Southgate, she went to her chiropractor one day, and the chiropractor did an examination of her and found a lump in one of her breasts. And it was not a small lump. At the time that he felt it, he said it felt like a really small apricot or orange. And he said, you need to go to your doctor now. And she went to her doctor and... Uh, her doctor, of course, diagnosed her with cancer. Now, Julia was a, a lady who wouldn't take no for an answer from a doctor. She wanted any kind of special treatment that she could do. So she went to Mexico and got Laetro treatments. And she did coffee enemas. And she did everything to fight the cancer that she could possibly do. Uh, she actually told me that she wasn't going to be able to come to Trinity much more because she had to spend so much time doing the special treatments that she wanted to have. And I got a phone call from her family about two years after that, and she was in the convalescent home. 
And they said, mom's there until she dies because the cancer is now advanced. And I went over to see Julia and I said, uh, Julia, I have never witnessed a person who has fought cancer harder than you have. This is as hard as I've ever seen anybody go through it. Poppy enemas, everything under the sun. And she said, yeah, they didn't work. I said, okay. God said, no. He's not going to cure your cancer here. Let me tell you what's heaven going to be like. And we described heaven from this passage. And when we got done, she looked over at me and then we went through it and she went, she was eating at the time. She, she looked up at me and she said, that's not half bad. I said, no, it's not. And you are going to be entering into God's presence at that time as well. And as special as the city is and as special as heaven is, the most special thing is that you're going to be able to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from him for all eternity. Uh, she died two days later. Uh, her son called me, said, uh, mom passed away. I have a question for you. She said, what did you tell mom? I said, what do you mean? She said, she had the strangest grin on her face after you talked to her. I said, well, I just told her what heaven was going to be like. You realize that when we talk about heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace, we don't know half of it. And we don't need to know the brilliance that it's going to be. And for us to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord, it is going to be, as Paul says, far better. As far as you can think, it's going to be better. It's going to be amazing in its own regards. You know, Bev left this home last Friday. Uh, and she's home with the Lord today. That is a, a very special thing to say. And for her, although she lived on a farm all of her life, she's now in the midst of the most beautiful farm that she's ever seen because she's in the presence of the Lord and be there forevermore. And when we get there, she's going to say, what took you so long? Because to be in the Lord's presence is going to be very special. Uh, being in a fire, that's not special. Being in pain, that's ugly. Being in joy in heaven, in a glorious city, with the light and the glory of God, that is special. And we get to experience it. Uh, let's pray, shall we? Father, I thank you for this passage that deals with what heaven is like. Lord, it's, it's hard to imagine a city that big. It's hard to imagine a wall going around it that's 216 feet high, filled with every glorious color of stone that you can imagine, and the brilliance of God's glory shining through it, with an angel guarding each of the gates, and the huge uh, uh, pearl at each one. And the 12 foundations of the apostles all around it. And God, the streets of that city are pure gold because that's what you made them. And yet you also have made special dwelling places for each of us. Based upon what we have done here upon the earth and based upon the glory that we brought you. And we can't imagine what those will be like. But Lord, let us realize this. When your word says that you went to prepare a place for us, that where you are, we may be one day also. You meant it. And it's going to be amazing. And it's going to cause us to worship you and worship you forever. Thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.